Good afternoon and, and welcome to the Canadian International Council, the National Capital Branch, uh, a session entitled The Diplomacy of Space Security. My name is Elizabeth Kingston and, and I'm the president of the branch. At a time when we are glancing more at the heavens, given the recent rover landing on Mars by the Americans, as well as missions by both China and the UAE to Mars, our session takes a renewed and important focus. We are delighted to have with us today two former colleagues who have worked in the area of arms control. Paul Meyer as our speaker and our moderator, Andrew Rasoulis. Paul Meyer is a fellow in international security and adjunct professor of international studies at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He's been there since 2011. Previously, Mr. Meyer had a 35 year career with the Canadian Foreign Service, including serving as Canada's ambassador to the United Nations and to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. He's a senior advisor um, and current chair of the Canadian Pugwash Group. He teaches the course on diplomacy at Simon Fraser University and writes on issues of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, space security, and international cyber security. Andrew Rasoulis joined the Department of National Defense in 1979 as an analyst specializing in strategic politico-military issues pertaining to conventional forces. These issues included emerging concepts of conventional defense strategies for Western Europe, as well as the Canadian government's efforts in the area of conventional arms control. In 1987, he was responsible for conventional arms control policy and was the department's representative on NATO's high level task force for conventional arms control from its inception in 86 to 89. Um, in 1989, he was posted as defense advisor to the Canadian delegation for conventional arms control to the Canadian delegation um, for, for, for the Canadian delegation for conventional arms control talks in Vienna. He's published numerous articles on conventional strategy, arms control and in, in, international military training cooperation. He's retired from the public service and is a freelance consultant and a fellow with CJAI, Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Uh, Andrew, prior to handing it over to you, I, I would just like to remind people with respect to their questions, if they could please uh, write it in the Q&A um, section and uh, Andrew will then field the questions to, uh, to Mr. Meyer. So thank you both very much, very much appreciate your participation. Andrew, over to you, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Liz, and uh, it's a great honor to be here tonight with Paul, an old colleague and friend, and uh, someone I greatly admire in the field of arms control, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say to us tonight. I'd like to thank CIC uh, for arranging this uh, tonight. It's, it's arms control has gone out of favor uh, these days, and uh, Paul is bringing it back to light and uh, in, in a very important way. And I think the CIC is doing uh, Canadians a great service by providing this platform for Paul to, uh, to allow us to hear his ideas and great experience in, in, in the world of arms control and how arms control relates to uh, diplomacy. Uh, something we need very much today. Paul, uh, welcome. And uh, we all look forward very much to uh, hearing uh, your presentation. After your presentation, um, I'll be looking at the chat line here uh, to see what, uh, what questions we have from the audience. And um, then I'll be feeding them to you uh, bit by bit and uh, we'll, we'll take the conversation for approximately uh, 45 minutes, I believe we have uh, on, uh, for us now. So Paul, please, over to you. Well, well uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew and, and uh, Elizabeth uh, for the, that introduction and, um, Indeed, in this talk, um, I wanted to address an area of public policy and global governance, which has been relatively neglected, uh, despite the increasing importance of the environment it concerns. And that environment is outer space. Today, we benefit from a wide array of space-enabled services, 
that frankly the average uh, citizen uses without any knowledge of how they were provided. The increase in satellites in orbit around the earth is exponential. Last year, there were roughly 2000 active operational satellites. This year, there are some 3000. And in the US alone, authorization requests for 16,000 further additional satellites have already been submitted uh, for a period of the next 10 years. So far from its past as a restricted rich countries only kind of club, there are now more than 60 states that own or operate satellites, many in the global south. And a dozen of those states actually have independent space launch capabilities. These strides in the use of outer space have been facilitated by an early treaty designating space as a global commons in which they can be, quote, no national appropriation or claim of sovereignty. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty, one of the great unsung achievements of multilateral diplomacy, further stipulated that space was to be used for, quote, peaceful purposes and, quote, for the benefit and in the interests of all countries. The Pacific intent of the treaty was reinforced by a ban on weapons of mass destruction being placed in space and on any militarization of the moon or other celestial bodies. This treaty with 110 states parties has provided a legal regime allowing for the exploration and exploitation of outer space free from man-made threats. Regrettably, just as an increase in the magnitude of civilian uses of space has occurred in recent years, so has an upswing in tensions among space powers and in the development of military counter space capabilities. A leading power has gone so far as to officially characterize outer space as a war fighting domain and has created a new space force to ensure dominance in it. Anti-satellite weapons, ASATs, which, have, which had been developed by both the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, but the testing of which had ceased in the mid 1980s are now being revived. The world was shocked when in 2007, China launched an ASAT against one of its own satellites that ended up creating thousands of pieces of enduring debris in the sensitive low earth orbit. The US followed suit the next year, albeit at a much lower altitude and therefore uh, the debris was not uh, enduring. And in March, 2019, wanting to be part of the big boys club, um, India also used a so-called kinetic kill vehicle on top of a direct ascent missile to destroy one of its own satellites. As anyone who watched the film Gravity will recall, space debris is already posing a threat to the safe operations of spacecraft in low earth orbit. And by the way, that's the orbit that is the most utilized by satellites, about 2,600 of those 3,000 active satellites are in low Earth orbit. And clearly debris causing ASATs would only exacerbate the problem, the existing problem of space debris. The international community seems aware of these threatening developments and regularly proclaims that it wants to prevent the weaponization of outer space. Each year, the UN General Assembly adopts with near unanimity a resolution entitled uh, the Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space, or PEROS for the acronym. That resolution calls for further measures, quote, to consolidate and reinforce the regime. 
end of quote, that, that regime is the regime built around the Elder Space Treaty. The declaratory policy is clear on what the goal should be. The problem is that there has been scant action by states to put it into practice. Indeed, key states are taking actions that contradict the desire to re retain other space for peaceful purposes. In the last decade, there have only been three diplomatic initiatives of note regarding other space security. The first, a Sino-Russian 2008 draft treaty on the prevention of placement of weapons in space. Second, an EU initiated international code of conduct that also was first introduced in 2008. And the third, a set of Canadian authored confidence building measures. While the Sino-Russian treaty um, attracted hostile criticism from the United States, um, and since it was confined to the conference on disarmament in Geneva, which has been in a state of self-created paralysis for over 20 years, the proposal has really gone nowhere. The EU mishandled the diplomatic rollout of its own proposal, and the initiative was abandoned in 2015 when it met opposition from the BRICS group of states, i.e. Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and South. Africa. The Canadian ideas for space security pledges set out in two working papers from 2007 and 2009 were not actively followed up and have faded from view. This was despite the powerful political direction given by then Prime Minister Paul Martin when in his 2004 address to the UN General Assembly he called for the extension of the Elder Space Treaty's ban on weapons of mass destruction to cover all forms of weaponry. Indeed, he said it would be a tragedy if Elder Space became one big weapons arsenal. So this handful of diplomatic initiatives petered out by the middle of the second decade of this century around the same time that the tensions among major space powers and the associated bellicose rhetoric began to soar. A revival of di diplomatic activism on behalf of space security is urgently required if we want to prevent outer space from becoming just another arena for armed conflict. The following are my top three suggestions for diplomatic initiatives. Number one, an optional protocol to the Elder Space Treaty. An optional protocol is a supplementary agreement to an existing treaty. This could be the legal vehicle to extend the existing ban on weapons of mass destruction enshrined in the Elder Space Treaty to cover all weapons as Paul Martin had championed. It also has the virtue of not requiring opening up of the Elder Space Treaty itself. Second would be to revive the International Code of Conduct. The EU initiated code had many positive features, but it's made in Brussels label lacked legitimacy. It needs to be brought into a UN mandated negotiation in which all could participate on equal terms. This would require a state to take leadership on a general assembly resolution to initiate the negotiation of such an international code. And third, there could be a ban on testing debris causing ASATs. This idea was among the proposals Canada advocated back in 2007. And Andrew may even recall that it also figured among the package of initiatives that Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau uh, put forward in his peace initiative of 1983-84 period. 
Canada, to its credit, has recently reiterated the desirability of concluding such a ban, which given the common interest in avoiding more space debris would seem an appealing near-term option. It would help overcome the current diplomatic inertia if the wider stakeholder community, especially the private sector, spoke up on the need for governmental action to preclude space weaponization. An ASAT attack, for example, could ruin Elon Musk's business model. Substantive progress would also require a state or two to champion in the relevant international forms, the options outlined above. A capable middle power with solid space credentials would be a natural leader. Perhaps Canada would again be willing to assume the leadership role it played some years ago and help ensure a benign space environment for future generations to benefit from. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. So it seems that um, uh, you're giving uh, Canada, I think, well, three very good options, but particularly the last one, which is a highly pragmatic one, uh, a way of um, upping its diplomatic game, which, uh, which has not been all that uh, active in some ways, particularly in the arms control world. Um, your paper that you wrote recently for CGI, Arms Control in Outer Space, uh, from a macro point of view of the big players, uh, the China, Russia, and the United States, um, the latest American publication that you uh, uh, analyze suggests that, and mind you, it was written under the Trump administration, suggests that uh, there's a serious American reluctance to engage in this area, um, presumably in order for Canadian initiatives at the UN or in Geneva uh, to go further in the, in the pragmatic ideas that you've proposed here, do you think that with the Biden administration that there's room for opening now with the United States to get them to become more open to pragmatic diplomacy to allow arms control to sort of mitigate the more sort of uh, impractical problems uh, such as debris and establish a code of conduct which would be like CSBMs, for example, in space. These are small steps that will lead to the bigger picture. No, I mean, uh, you're, you're absolutely right uh, that uh, the uh, basic uh, hostility <laughs> shown by the Trump administration towards all forms of arms control uh, gave uh, little hope that under uh, that administration, we could see uh, cooperation uh, coming forward. Uh, and uh, the Biden administration, though it hasn't uh, pronounced much on this topic, uh, to date, has sent a few signals uh, earlier in the week uh, in uh, his inaugural speech to the Conference on Disarmament in, in Geneva, uh, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, did refer to the, uh, uh, the danger of ASATs and uh, the need for restraint. Uh, uh, I would have liked to have seen that sort of followed up with and this is a proposal that uh, I am putting before this body uh, to uh, ban the testing of debris causing ASATs. That wasn't there. And there was a little bit of the blame game, like it was all Russia's and China's uh, fault uh, that we have this, these problems in, in, in space. Um, but, that, but that said, um, there, I would hope will be um, a revival of uh, more uh, positive consideration of cooperative measures as one uh, aspect of trying to preserve uh, outer space uh, for peaceful purposes to avoid um, escalating uh, the uh, existing problems of debris, et cetera. Uh, and it is uh, an area where I do uh, feel that we will hear more from other stakeholders, non-state stakeholders like industry. I mean, uh, the growth in, in the uh, utilization of space is just uh, amazing in the last few years. Um, a month ago, uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX uh, launched a Falcon 9 rocket that put into orbit 143 satellites, one rocket. 
And those satellites, you know, varied in size from uh, about the smartphone uh, dimensions to that of a kitchen fridge. Um, but it's all part of uh, increasing um, benefiting from space enabled services that cover just such a, a wide gamut. Uh, uh, just before coming on, on this talk, I um, was looking at a CBC news item about the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada uh, putting $7 million into something called a dark vessel detection uh, program, which uh, relying on satellite surveillance um, is designed to cue um, uh, developing countries when their uh, waters, their exclusive economic zone is being subject to illegal fishing. And part of the problem there is that, well, all vessels now are supposed to, under IMO regulation, carry something called an AIS, an automatic uh, identification system. It's like a transponder. Um, these illegal fishing vessels had turned it off simply. And normally that would have meant they would be invisible to any kind of uh, controls. Whereas this uh, satellite surveillance uh, capability then would allow uh, this program to alert you know, the Ecuadors of the world, the Pacific islands that there are, um, uh, and give uh, obviously the uh, uh, the coordinates of these uh, illegal fishing vessels that could enable them to be actually uh, interdicted and uh, and uh, arrested and those responsible arrested. So uh, that's just you know one one example I, I throw out, but uh, it's it's all in a sense though dependent on that low Earth orbit in particular remaining uh, a usable orbit. So Paul, I mean that's a very interesting thing. I mean the the, the uh, sort of we're traditionally used to just state actors playing the game and international organizations like the United Nations or the CSE or OSCE. But you're suggesting that, you know, privateers, if you will, uh, like Musk, uh, they have a stake now. They're actors in this game. They could actually make lethal weapons if they wanted to, presumably. Um, and so that uh, there is a self-interest uh, for these players to become engaged in perhaps an international regime that puts some measure of control and transparency. And I think, as we know in arms control, there's the control of things, and then there's a the transparency and conference building or code of conduct, as you said. And these things work together, complementary, uh, to, to, uh, to actually bring about a, a better situation. Do you think that Canada could take an initiative in establishing like a, a task force, uh, that would open the door to consultations with the private sector. That would seem to be novel, and a novel idea that you're suggesting. How would you go about seeing that happen? Yes, I mean, I think there are many avenues if uh, Canada wanted to exercise some leadership that they could, uh, that would be constructive. Uh, and clearly part of this is recognizing that in any new regime or initiatives, cooperative initiatives for other space, uh, the uh, non-state stakeholders have to be part of the consultation and, and indeed are, are important in, uh, in inputting into the design. Um, and uh, you know, this is where some of the disparities um, uh, exist uh, in the, being associated with a number of NGOs after leading uh, government service. And you know, we do our, our bit and try to knock on doors and, and promote and advocate for certain uh, policies. But uh, you know, compare that with the kind of lobbying clout uh, that rich corporations have. Uh, you know, when they want government to change or modify a policy, uh, they uh, are not shy about uh, exerting a lot of uh, lobbying uh, muscle on those uh, governments. Um, and uh, I think Elon Musk has now uh, surpassed Jeff Bezos as the richest man in the world. I mean, he could finance a lot of this uh, out of his co coffee fund, you know, for uh, Skylink. Um, so, it, you know, that's, I think, what we have to see. And, and uh, I think as they, um, and again, it is quite recent, but as they really uh, ramp up uh, utilization space, they are becoming more sensitive to uh, uh, the uh, threat that this um, 
unique operating environment could be spoiled for them and for everyone uh, by irresponsible state behavior. So I, I do think um, that's a powerful constituency. It's still in the intergovernmental uh, system, um, will require uh, some state allies of any movement like that. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, regrettably, this area has just suffered from neglect. Uh, uh, I really had expected, uh, maybe uh, uh, naively, that the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of the Outer Space Treaty you know, would have been a, an event marked by governments around the world in, in a major way. You know, it went by uh, you know, without uh, a peep. Um, and I think because, unfortunately, certain uh, space powers are don't want necessarily to be reminded about the constraints of the Outer Space uh, Treaty um, and uh, the fact that it's a legal uh, regime. Uh, so uh, it could be useful simply, and I've put this forward as a proposal for a few years now, how about just convening a meeting of the state's parties of the Outer Space Treaty to talk about the state of the of the regime and what might uh, be done uh, to, in a sense, uh, sustain uh, the vision of outer space as this global commons where um, humankind can engage in, in peaceful activity. Uh, um, because the Outer Space Treaty was a very early multilateral accord, it made no provision for um, what are now almost standard features of any um, international accord, which is an annual meeting or biannual meeting of states' parties, uh, uh, review conferences every five, six years. That sort of um, follow-up mechanism wasn't there. Uh, but there's nothing to prevent uh, a, a state or a group of states to convene such a meeting. And I think that would be also a very helpful um, helpful step. I, and I, I suggested in my presentation three possible sort of arms control measures that could happen. But uh, obviously, uh, you don't um, immediately spring that on uh, an international community. And, and by having you no know, consultations with uh, like-minded uh, countries uh, beforehand, you could see maybe which one of these is uh, the ripest or, or most likely to uh, gain support and, and proceed. Uh, um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, di diplomatic, uh, so uh, one on one, in, in some ways, you know, to how you, you know, begin to advance certain goals in the international arena, but uh, it does require uh, some leadership. Uh, that is a quality that still is is very uh, necessary. Well, I think the the door certainly is open to Canada, who seems to be, you know, we've got that uh, experience in space stuff, um, and it uh, and we are non threatening. Uh, we don't have. Um, a lethal capability, uh, and we could certainly um, advance. The, this is a typical, a really classic Canadian uh, solution waiting to happen. Um, how would you, in your paper, you also mention um, about the Sino-Russian proposal. You've mentioned it briefly here as well. And um, could you please just connect the dots for uh, the audience and myself uh, between the Sino-Soviet, the Sino-Russian proposal and um, the, the Space Treaty of 67 in terms of what's, where's the value at? Speak a bit, a bit about, the, uh, about that uh, Sino-Russian proposal and what, what's it all about? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, in, in some ways it's a draft treaty that uh, is designed to accomplish what this Paros resolution you know, says it is necessary, which is uh, to take further measures to prevent the weaponization of space. So what the Chinese and Russians uh, have put forward is uh, that there would be a ban on the placement of weapons of any kind in outer space. And remember the Outer Space Treaty's prohibition is only on weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and it goes on that there would be a prohibition on the threat or use of force against space objects. Uh, so uh, that is what they uh, outlined in the draft. It elicited, uh, as I noted, criticism um, uh, mainly from the United States on a couple of fronts. One was uh, that uh, they said, oh, well, we don't like the definition of a space weapon and uh, that uh, any, any object in a sense could be weaponized. Um, Personally, I think that's a bit a bit lame. Uh, you could work out on uh, on uh, a uh, I think suitable definition. 
but also you can uh, take the approach of not defining the term, but still having it appear. Uh, it may come as a surprise to some that the very well supported uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty um, never defines what a nuclear weapon is. Um, uh, so uh, that's, uh, I think, an, uh, an objection that could be managed. Then there's on verification and uh, they, uh, the, the critique goes, well, the, the Sino-Russian treaty doesn't outline a whole verification regime. And uh, it, it doesn't, but uh, it acknowledges that it could be uh, a supplementary protocol to do so. Um, and uh, in my mind, uh, the monitoring capabilities again, both in the private sector now, as well as in uh, the government sector, have improved uh, uh, many times over that there actually could be very uh, uh, capable uh, means, technical means, national technical means, if you, if you wish, uh, that could uh, verify uh, a, a ban on uh, space weapon placement. And then the third, uh, major objective is the US pointing out, oh, well, but your treaty by its ban on weapons uh, being put in outer space ignores ground to space anti-satellite weapons, for example. And you know, that uh, is where the main threat currently lies. So uh, the approach there um, could be, well, and this is where I think uh, uh, the, uh, U.S. might find, find itself in an uncomfortable position if uh, their uh, suggestion of, uh, of this gap was actually picked up on and uh, the Chinese and Russians said, okay, we will extend to uh, banning ground to space uh, anti-satellite weapons. Well, the devil in that detail is that uh, the ballistic missile defense interceptors that the U.S. have deployed on its Aegis uh, 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 naval vessels uh, have an inherent anti-satellite capability. Indeed, that's what was used to uh, conduct that, uh, uh, that destruction of an American uh, satellite that I referred to in 2008. So, um, and as you know well, Andrew, um, uh, the Americans for a number of years have uh, strenuously uh, resisted any effort to bring defensive strategic uh, missile systems into arms control negotiations uh, ever since they uh, abrogated the ABM treaty, which was just that, a treaty uh, restricting uh, uh, ballistic missile defense systems. Um, so uh, it, I think, is um, no, not a very um, valid um, uh, complaint uh, by the US on, on that, as uh, I don't think they would be ready to, at this time at least, to entertain an arms control measure that attempted both to ban weapons in space as well as ground to space uh, uh, weapons. Uh, the other and completely independent problem, and I, in some ways I fault uh, Russia and China on this, is that they've insisted that their draft treaty, treaty could only be uh, considered at the conference on disarmament, which um, for problems that I won't get into now um, uh, is in a state of gridlock. And so uh, there's no official work uh, going on. And uh, up to now, at least Moscow and Beijing have not been willing to take their draft treaty and bring it into a form like the UN General Assembly where uh, you don't need uh, consensus in order to start some work so uh, that, uh, in a nutshell, um, is the situation with the Sino-Russian Treaty. Well, the, um, the, the question and answers are starting to roll in. Um, so we've got one from Peggy Mason, uh, who's an old colleague, uh, and she's giving you some space about uh, Canadian policy to, to pick up on your points. I'll read her, her, her comment. In the 2017 defense policy, it states that Canada is committed to the peaceful use of space, and also that, quote, Canada can demonstrate leadership by promoting the military and civilian norms of responsible space behavior to ensure the peaceful use of outer space, unquote. I take it from your comments, this aspect of defense policy has not been acted upon. Thank you, Peggy. Paul. 
Yes, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Peggy, for for that uh, question. And uh, I mean, you're you're quite right that the defense policy review of uh, 2017 uh, did uh, give that uh, expression. And um, there's another section, I mean, the, from the one you cited in, in your question that I'd like to read, uh, quote, from that 2017 safe, secure, engaged uh, uh, policy document, quote, we actively support global affairs Canada's participation in international diplomatic efforts to ensure that space does not become an arena of conflict. End of quotation. So um, alas, while well, d has said we're all there to support GAC's Global Affairs Canada's diplomatic initiatives, the problem is uh, Global Affairs Canada has done very little in terms of uh, such uh, an efforts. Uh, and uh, so in a way, D&D uh, &D, um, is uh, left off the hook, if you will, um, that uh, they're all for supporting uh, GAC's initiatives, but GAC hasn't come up with any. Um, and that I think, well, uh, is a sorry, uh, again, uh, state statement about the uh, inertia, uh, put it kind of mildly, uh, of our diplomacy. In, on behalf of space security. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Paul and uh, Peggy. We can always follow up on the on the chat line. But I've got uh, another thing from Hamid, uh, who says that um, is it true that accumulation of space debris could compromise the integrity of the protective ring around the planet? You got that one, Paul. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, meant by protective ring. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think uh, it was one of the scientific ones. Um, uh, probably yeah, the, I mean, there are, there are, you know, elements uh, in terms of uh, our ozone level and uh, up in the stratosphere, you know, protects us from uh, gamma ray and other uh, uh, detrimental sort of uh, emissions. Uh, but what I was uh, basically saying is that orbit, uh, and even though space is vast, the low Earth orbit is now getting to be a bit congested. And... Uh, Clearly, the debris um, threat, and there's something like 22,000 pieces that are tractable, uh, that are above 10 centimeters in size, um, and uh, some estimated half a million pieces that are smaller than 10 centimeters. And when you know you're you're traveling at uh, something like uh, eight kilometers a second, um, it's uh, uh, even a, a small chip of paint. Uh, can be uh, uh, nasty, uh, can create nasty effects. So uh, that's where I think protection of the usability of a space orbit is what is the uh, uh, imminent sort of problem or challenge. There's uh, another one from uh, Nicholas Rasoulis. Uh, As a material site in Earth's orbit and arm, no pun intended, of multilateral diplomacy, what role, if any, might the International Space Station or other multilateral orbital spacecrafts that could emerge in the future play in extraterrestrial arms control? Yes, well, um, actually, I, I think, um, well, the sort of two dimensions to this. One, I, I should point out, um, and you know, when we talk about um, the uh, peaceful orientation of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, it also um, was uh, uh, redolent with a sense of international cooperation. You know that this is a realm, this unique environment where humankind could actually work together. And the, there are clauses of the treaty that talk about how astronauts or cosmonauts, for instance, should be treated as you know, envoys of all mankind in the language of the, of, of the treaty. And that the, the um, uh, exploration that was going on, that the, the results of that should be shared with the international scientific com uh, community, etc. So I like to see the International Space uh, Station as a manifestation of uh, um, the better, better angels of our nature. Uh, you know, here we have uh, Russia and the United States, uh, fierce competitors, uh, uh, so 
for so many years, um, uh, cooperating uh, together on this venture. Um, so I think it's a reminder to us all that it doesn't have to be a war fighting domain. It can be a domain of remarkable international cooperation. And you know the excitement I think that we all feel with uh, the uh, moon probes and now the, the, the Martian um, uh, rover is, uh, is a reminder you know, that this is a, a great um, community of interest that we could have around it. Um, the second more technical um, uh, answer is that uh, one of the problems with the debris is, you know, how can we maybe um, ameliorate it by uh, what's called active debris removal, uh, putting up certain spacecraft with the view to um, capturing uh, particularly larger pieces of debris before they can fragment into uh, thousands of, of dangerous particles as it were um, and bring them down sufficiently that Earth's gravity will drag them into the uh, atmosphere and burn up and, and therefore no longer pose the, the problem. And there's some interesting uh, pilot projects currently underway uh, that uh, attempt to uh, uh, take care of this uh, debris problem to some extent. So uh, that's an area where I do see, you know, uh, artificial spacecraft uh, specialized uh, with specialized functions could be a very constructive um, future development. Thank you, Paul. Um, Peggy's going to follow up uh, on the issue of defensive systems being brought into arms control. There seems to be some feeling that the Biden administration may be considering this as it is necessary. If there are to be talks along following the new start, if so, then the prospects for a Russia Sino Treaty become a bit more positive. Comment? Yes, I, I would like to think that uh, there's a willingness to go in that way. Um, there's actually a, a line in the preamble of the New START Treaty, which as you know, has just been extended for five years that uh, acknowledges that there's a relationship between strategic offense and strategic defense. The problem is uh, nothing has been done to go beyond that uh, sort of gesture towards that reality. Um, and as far as I know, I've seen no indication yet from the Biden administration that they would be willing to uh, negotiate on uh, ballistic missile defense. Um, you know, they've uh, signaled that they'd uh, like to expand the scope of strategic arms reductions, uh, talking about including uh, sub-strategic weapon systems, um, including uh, warheads that are uh, in reserve as well as warheads that are deployed. Um, so there are gestures in that regard and they have sort of five years in which to come up with a a follow-on uh, on negotiation, uh, but um, uh, I'm not. Uh, it's going to take more uh, to sort of get the um, opposition uh, uh, against any constraints on ballistic missile defense uh, from the American reality, and of course, uh, there's a strong uh, congressional opposition uh, in the Republican Party, in particular, uh, to doing that. Uh, so uh, while I think we, we need to uh, work that uh, area, I don't see it as being a, a near-term sort of possibility. Thanks. Um, Tariq Abusai has a question, which if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, it's, um, I believe it's question, it says, where is the location of other countries which are not parts of space technology and weapons in the diplomacy of space security. So I think it's those who are actually not technologically with, the, uh, have the capability, but where are they, I guess, in the diplomatic sphere, presumably the United yes. Nations or the or, or Geneva? Yes, uh, I mean, I haven't mentioned it uh, to now, but uh, there is in uh, Vienna, the Committee uh, on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, and that is uh, under, supported by the UN office of outer space affairs, I think currently has 95 uh, members in that committee. So, um, and it's been, it's uh, seen quite significant growth over the last few years. 
that uh, contains a, a good subset of the developing countries who may not themselves um, possess uh, space technology. Uh, but you'll, you'll also be surprised by uh, the number that um, of developing countries who have managed to uh, uh, have dedicated satellites uh, for their own uh, use. Um, and uh, it's in that way that there is uh, very much an expanding community. And, um, and one hopes that that will maybe facilitate some of the attention to cooperative measures that I've, I've spoken about because more uh, of these states will see a stake in it for themselves uh, not to mess up uh, other space and deprive them of some of these useful space enabled functions that they've beginning, beginning to uh, uh, capitalize on. Thank you, Paul. So we're at the point now where, um, and I'm just learning how to deal with Zoom land here um, in terms of questions. On the Q&A, those of you who are on, on this thing, there are no more questions on chat. On this other side of the screen, David Lee has a question, but it hasn't come through. And we're asking David to put it on the Q&A, but I, as of yet, I have not seen it. Uh, so uh, David Lee, if you're able to put something in Q&A, we'd be happy to have Paul answer your question. Yeah, I actually I, I see uh, David's uh, question on the chat function. Um, and uh, in my, the first part of it is what's the attitude of the Biden administration? I think I've already uh, addressed that. Um, uh, he asks about uh, whether uh, industry could put pressure on uh, and indeed, uh, as I know that I think that is a, a very promising near-term sort of political uh, impetus that we may see as uh, these big companies uh, realize that uh, uh, governments are capable of doing really crazy things and that if they can um, uh, intervene early uh, to try to uh, ensure that doesn't come about, uh, that is good. And then uh, finally, he has a, a quite an interesting uh, suggestion um, regarding the role that Paul Martin might be able to play in this. Uh, I did refer to uh, his um, the powerful uh, address to the General Assembly when he was prime, prime minister. Um, and uh, I think it is always um, helpful in, in this uh, to think about uh, the possibilities of using prominent personalities not just those who are currently in government uh, to contribute. I mean, I think having Chris Hatfield uh, involved in uh, consultations about uh, the future of, of uh, outer space uh, and cooperation, you know, would attract lots of uh, lots of people. Uh, and you know, you need to think creatively about uh, these uh, these matters. Um, I'm I'm pleased to say that uh, two years ago, two uh, two colleagues out here on the west coast. Uh, Michael Byers and Aaron Boley of the University of British Columbia. Uh, Michael Byers, uh, basic a political science international law expert, and Aaron Boley, an astrophysicist, uh, came together to create something called the Outer Space Institute. Um, you can check it out, outerspaceinstitute.ca is the URL. Uh, and uh, I was asked to, to be a founding member uh, along with uh, some other uh, notables, uh, uh, Mac Evans, former uh, president of the Canadian Space Agency, uh, Lucy Stoyak, uh, who works in Montreal as an um, academic at, uh, um, uh, at uh, the Eau d'Ecole Commerciale. Uh, so um, it uh, was designed to raise the profile, basically, of outer space and it, the challenges it faces in the Canadian uh, context. And uh, uh, like so many, uh, it's Part of its activities would be dependent on a positive response to a grant application, but um, you can see already that uh, that uh, amongst us we've uh, contributed some talks and articles and op-eds, and you know I hope that that will help uh, stimulate you know further thought uh, because again uh, we are all stakeholders in terms of uh, continued uh, unmolested use of outer space. Yeah, so, so on that, I mean, uh, we're, we're flipping between the both sides here, but let me just follow up on Dave, because David Lee's got a follow up, which is a really interesting thing. Um, the, the Canadian current foreign minister uh, uh, has a background in space. So what do you think of Mark Garneau's sort of interest in picking your stuff up, Paul? 
Yeah, well, you know, it would be um, it would be super if uh, <laughs> he was prepared uh, to uh, champion this. Uh, uh, I must say, I'm a little uh, skeptical. Uh, you know, in that article that's uh, from the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, I I have a, a section in which I lament about how pathetic the uh, space issues page of Global Affairs uh, Canada's website, you know, is uh, where it's uh, it has information on that EU code of conduct as if it was to be completed at the end of 2015. Well, it failed in the summer of 2015, and uh, six years later, that's the most up-to-date information that's on the uh, website. Uh, not to mention that it's almost devoid of Canadian content. Content. Now, I find it an embarrassment that the Canadian Foreign Ministry's website on space has almost nothing to say about what Canadian diplomacy has done in this area and what it's currently. So uh, I would hope that we begin to have uh, you know, some uh, uh, revival of life and, and thought in uh, the halls of the Pearson Building uh, when it comes to uh, space uh, security issues. And we again see uh, uh, some flicker of life in terms of uh, Canadian diplomatic activism uh, in this vital realm. Thank you. Um, David DeMint, um, he's really going off further into space. He's saying, as we are returning to the moon in advance of going to Mars, how do you, how can we understand space security beyond Earth? Well, um, it's true that you know, the current focus has essentially been in Earth orbit, um, but uh, uh, as I know that um, you know, the Outer Space Treaty uh, has clear prohibitions on the militarization of the moon and uh, other celestial bodies. And, and uh, there may be an, a need to remind some of the uh, state's parties of that treaty about that, because uh, just the other day, someone brought to my attention a, a DARPA, you know, Defense Advanced Research Program, arm of the Department of Defense in the United States, uh, had uh, calling out for uh, bids on uh, establishing installations on the moon. Well, uh, there's a specific, I say, prohibition about military installations on, on the moon. And they had a nice little graphic with a little robot with a DARPA logo on uh, cavorting on the moon's surface. Um, so <laughs> though there are existing constraints and we better see that they're observed and, uh, and states be willing to protest if uh, there are signs that uh, this is being uh, trampled on. Thank you. Um, Benjamin Sigos Bisto, if I've got it wrong, I apologize if I got it wrong. Is it time for us to start thinking of how a preemptive war policy may apply to deal with eminent threats uh, brought by anti-satellite technology, ASAT, in space? Well, uh, I think uh, clearly that there is a, a risk, you know, that, that there could be those that would see uh, value in, in a preemption uh, strike against uh, uh, military satellites of their enemy. Uh, and as we know, uh, so much, again, of terrestrial military activity is uh, space enabled uh, through communications, through reconnaissance, through targeting, etc. cetera. Um, now, uh, that, I think, uh, is uh, another reason for trying to ramp up some cooperative measures, trying to uh, solidify certain norms that would preclude that because it would uh, represent uh, not only uh, a severe risk to that uh, adversary, but again, particularly if uh, it involves uh, debris, um, uh, ASATs, recausing ASATs, it would uh, be a risk to all users of those orbits. Paul, the, this question from Shane Roberts has got some um, acronyms that you may you may be familiar with, but I'm not. So I'm going to take a chance that, that you've got it. Um, are you aware of the UN's efforts to encourage nations to look at and preparing for the risks posed by NEOs and PHOs? Question. There is a gray area where possibly some nations might place explosives in space ostensibly uh, in preparation for dealing with NEOs. Yeah, that's uh, near-Earth objects. And 
actually, this is an area where international cooperation is, is pretty robust. I mean, there's something called planetary defense, which as the name suggests, is basically um, efforts to uh, <laughs> defend the planet from uh, possible uh, damage from uh, near earth objects, asteroids, uh, comets, what have you. And uh, there is uh, some uh, excellent uh, uh, scientific commercial work uh, in identifying uh, uh, which objects might pose uh, some risk um, and uh, to develop some strategies about uh, de de deflection and, and the like. Uh, uh, so uh, that is, is, is going on. I wouldn't want to uh, uh, exaggerate you know, the risk because often uh, when uh, the calculation suggests it's in a point, not, 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 but uh, it's at least being tracked and, and there are good minds thinking about, uh, about it. I think uh, maybe a more likely problem is, is uh, space mining, um, which uh, is uh, now appearing more feasible than it has been for many years. And where, again, uh, if it's not done properly, you could, in fact, maybe uh, throw a, an asteroid off its current orbit in, in a way where it becomes uh, a risk uh, to the planet. Uh, and uh, here again, there's a need for multilateral frameworks, rules of the road. And one of the things the Outer Space Institute has uh, recently uh, issued is an open letter to Canadian government, but also more uh, broadly calling for the initiations of negotiations in the Committee of the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space as to what regime should govern space mining and the use of space resources going forward, rather than leaving it to just unilateral uh, initiatives, be it from states or corporations. Well, and I've got a question here that allows you to talk about exactly what you do these days, Paul, uh, from Tariq Abu Sahib. Is there any institute or university in Canada which offers studies and courses uh, in diplomacy and of space security? Well, I, I, I wish there I wish there was, but uh, currently I, I'm not aware of any. Um, as I uh, did note, uh, the Outer Space Institute has generating very good uh, materials uh, for those interested in in studying this uh, realm more in all its dimensions. Um, Michael Byers, I know, does offer a course uh, at UBC occasionally on uh, the sort of politics of space security and, and international law. Um, but it's a field, as I flagged at the beginning of this talk, I feel it has been relatively neglected. Uh, uh, and um, uh, despite its growing significance as a as an item of global public policy. Paul, we're uh, drawing to the close here and, uh, and I've gotten the message that we have time for two questions and there happen to be two questions on our Q&A. There, there are follow-up questions. One is from Peggy and one is from Nicholas. Uh, so let me read, I'll read them both to you and then we can perhaps draw to conclusion. So from Peggy, uh, when D&D discusses cyber and space, they also use the terminology of quote, space as a war fighting domain, like any other, unquote. How can this be correct given the OST, but presumably GAC has not pushed back on this, but we need to draw attention to this, Paul. And then the next one from Nicholas Rasoulis is, could you please speak more to the notion you mentioned of outer space being a commons as well as to the tension between establishing and or maintaining both common and private, including individual persons, corporation states, property. Over to you, Paul. And that'll be that. That'll be the, the uh, time we have yeah. for those questions. Uh, you know, I have to look at, at uh, SSE again, uh, Peggy. I don't recall it actually uh, saying in that the, the Canada considers it a war fighting uh, domain. Uh, uh, it uh, uses, it characterizes it as a domain that is quote, congested, competitive and contested, which is a language um, directly drawn from US Department of Defense documents. And 
often said I prefer a uh, Canadian policy to do its own thinking for it rather than plagiarize uh, what is um, cliched language from south of the border. It's also uh, uh, conspicuous in its absence of another C word, which is cooperation, which I've spoken a lot about, and which is also there. So it's a reminder that it's critical how you frame uh, a problem and an issue. And if you frame it as one of confrontation, you're likely to get kind of confrontational kind of solutions proposed. If you frame it as one where this cooperation is a viable uh, alternative, you may get cooperative uh, or, or proposals for cooperative behavior. Um, there's a whole literature on the global commons. It's a, it's a concept uh, in uh, particularly international law, uh, most notably uh, you know, the high seas are, are, are uh, designated in that, that regard. It's the idea that um, there is a, uh, an environment that is outside national appropriations or claims of sovereignty. And I think um, it is uh, the conflict prevention aspect of the Elder Space Treaty in designating space in this way is something that again is underappreciated. Uh, just reflect on all the terrestrial wars and conflicts that have been fought over uh, disputes over territory, uh, 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 conflicting claims of sovereignty, and uh, you recognize that hey, maybe the, the founders, uh, the drafters of the Elder Space Treaty were onto a really a very positive uh, uh, avenue in seeing the conflict prevention potential of de declaring this realm as a global commons, you know, rather than uh, an area that could be uh, divvied up uh, by predatory states. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think with that, we'll have to um, close off. And uh, before I hand it to Liz to, to do the final closing, let me just say, Paul, thank you. Uh, it was refreshing to have your thoughts, insight into a very much neglected um, uh, uh, area of Canadian diplomacy. And uh, certainly I think uh, Canadian diplomacy could benefit by your suggestions and uh, your notable personality in this, uh, in this area. And one can only hope that uh, uh, Minister Garneau uh, will take the opportunity to put some, some new initiatives in space. So uh, thank you again, Paul and um, Liz. Um, I hand it back to you to, uh, for the final wrap. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for their questions. So is Liz going to? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my video is not uh, is not working, but I believe you can hear me. Is that yes, correct? Yes, yes, yeah. we can hear you. Uh, but I just, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, uh, Paul, very much for uh, the uh, uh, really uh, wonderful uh, discussion, uh, really broad ranging, and, and as Andrew had had suggested, uh, realization of how much really that uh, needs to be undertaken in in this area, and and uh, and how Canada can can contribute, and uh, notwithstanding as well, or most importantly, it's a foreign minister who is a former astronaut as well, and and how. Uh, uh, Minister Garneau can become party to 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 this. Um, but uh, thank you very very much uh, for uh, for your uh, thoughtful uh, discussion and and Andrew as well. Thank you very much for uh, for moderating so so well and and uh, to to share your uh, your experiences with with Paul as well over the years. Um, I, I would like to, in closing, um, thank uh, Laura Bradbury. Um, member of our board who, uh, who uh, took the initiative to, to arrange uh, this important session and uh, Hamid Georgiani as well, our program director who, uh, who was instrumental in putting it together along with Samuel Amua. I'd like to thank you all uh, very much for your, your work in coordinating today's event. So again, thank you very much and uh, very much appreciate uh, the uh, the work that you have done, Paul, in this area, and, and I thank you all to the the participants for for being party to this.